Good morning everyone. This is Scott Close with Ethos Geological and today I'm here to present to you Distilling Artificial Intelligence, a short primer on real-world predictive techniques. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning have quite a bit of jargon that's going on with them, especially now. We have Tesla with their self-driving cars, Facebook with image recognition, and so many more new technologies that it's being very difficult to keep up with all of these. And so today's presentation is trying to dispel or distill, break down, cut through the jargon, and point to a few predictive techniques or analytical techniques that you, I, anybody can use that are really simple, that are immensely helpful in our business. So to do that, let's first talk about what artificial intelligence, machine, and deep learning actually mean. So artificial intelligence means simply using machines to solve general problems. So that is not necessarily the robot or the ET of uh, the future or the past. It's actually leveraging computing power to produce output that is useful on data that's too complex or take too long for humans to do. So that is artificial intelligence. Machine learning evolved from artificial intelligence as the same type of algorithm. However, it learns how to solve a problem. We may provide it training data sets, or we may go through and do any sorts of other types of tweaks and hacks that allow us to leverage that for another higher stage of output. And then we have deep learning, which is the most evolved form of artificial intelligence, which is actually probably what most people think of when they hear the term AI. Deep learning is a true neural network. Instead of trying to say A equals B plus C to D to E to F, deep learning tries to get the Z straight from A with a bunch of random shortcuts in between. It's more like your actual brain. All right, so the types in each one of these categories, again, artificial intelligence is just an output of something intelligent where we leverage the power of computing. Machine learning is a subset of AI with really two types, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Supervised means the humans guide the learning process, either with a training data set or to correct the output, feed that back into the original input. Um, unsupervised, let it do its thing. We don't provide training data set. We don't really correct its output. We just simply observe the process. Typically, machine learning is all about reducing the dimensions of really complex data sets and or observing what types of clusters sit within that data. So analyses for these, which are advanced statistics, are principal component analysis, factor analysis, and several others that allow us to go in and really investigate the character, the shape, or the families of the data. Many models exist uh, for machine learning, such as k-neural networks, which we'll talk about at some point here. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Here we have quite large, quite complex data sets, uh, a lot of many different types of layers within this data, very, very different from your standard XY type of data, uh, typical table. And deep learning, the true power of deep learning comes in when we start to test and contribute to the positive or negative results and turn that back into it as an input. And we let this deep learning cycle continue to evolve. So one common question I get all the time is what is the distant, distance, what is the difference between statistics and forms of artificial intelligence? And the result is, or the truth is, the purpose. So for most statistical models, we're looking to have some sort of inference about the data itself. What is the average? What is the max? What is the min? What are the unique variables? Uh, what variables occur more than once? What variables occur less than 100 times? 
are these variable are these variables correlative uh, are correlated are they normally distributed do they have a left skew a right skew a right skew etc it's all about the relationship between the actual data whereas machine and deep learning models are about using that data to form predictions that can be tested so classifying complex data data where we may not be able to see it with the human eye or relationships that we can't pick out without pretty intense repetitive statistic analyses we might shove into the machine learning or the deep learning bin and it's not always clear they very much overlap what is artificial intelligence how do I touch it how do I grab it how do I use it what is this black box technology today artificial intelligence publicly is at least as far as I know not yet a human brain think of AI as more like stats on top of stats on top of stats on top of stats an example would be you have a reasoning statement and if then logic if I'm sitting in this chair therefore there must be gravity let's measure the gravity now let's stack that on top of if I turn the chair from one direction or to the other does that change gravity kind of a simple uh, use case I suppose but the idea is that real advanced machine learning to date are these reasoning logic statements on top of other statements on top of other statements on top of other statements and so on so we get this really complicated network of logic and reasoning that computers are able to do our minds are able to do it but humans aren't able to do it with data that we process through our eyes as fast as computers can so in order for any of this to process in a reasonable timeline we need the fastest and the biggest hardware possible so bring in the cloud this type of statistics or algorithms are not really suited for your laptop or your desktop hardware you can try it and you can run it sometimes it'll work especially if you have small data but in the big data we want processing time on minutes to days or hours not weeks to months so that we leverage the power of the cloud Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services are two examples of the more popular kinds where we're talking about virtual computers that have more than 60 CPUs greater than 90 gigabytes of RAM and terabytes of fast storage a general note on the tools that are going to be used in general there is a lot of different code bases that can be used to run machine learning deep learning models however there are some differences among the code bases and that matters so for example shown on this slide you can have one go for running around hitting stuff with a rock hammer and that's one go for doing work but many of these languages have learned to utilize all the CPUs or all of the RAM that's available so that you can have any n number of gophers running around and doing work so you can accomplish tasks faster and there are certain code bases that are designed for that and certain that only emulate it or are only semi designed for it Python is a single gopher code base it does emulate parallel processing but it doesn't do a great job at it there are code bases that do a fantastic job in multiprocessing R, Golang, Rust, C, and more. These are multi threaded code bases that allow you to launch as many gophers as you can possibly handle on these cloud based machines to go through and perform work, which is really important when it comes to the stacked processes that I discussed of prior with machine learning and deep learning. So today I'm going to cover three types of artificial intelligence. Uh, the exploratory factor analysis, which is bridge that statistics machine learning. K-nearest neighbors, which is solidly in machine learning. And a random forest, which is machine learning and starting to bridge the deep learning types of AI. First up, which is my personal favorite, exploratory factor analysis. I have yet to meet a data set, it's complex, that I can't perform exploratory fa factor analyses upon and get some sort of incredible insight as to what's going on. So, what is a factor analysis? The idea is that you have 
a multi-dimensional data set. So consider a bunch of rock samples. And each one of those rock samples might have a geochemical assay, gold, copper, cadmium, etc. That it could be any n number of analyses. They're all attached to that single rock sample. And you can have any n number of rock samples. And perhaps we would like to figure out does gold occur with copper? Does cadmium occur with lead? Etc. So that is what we would call a multi dimensional data set. Factor analysis is able to go through and in multi dimensional space rank the optimal relationships among each one of the variables. It is incredible how cool it works. One way to think about this is if you were to plot up two variables in XY space and you may see a trend of that data which would mean they would infer that they are correlated or you may see total noise which would infer that those two variables aren't correlated and then repeat with A to C repeat with A to D A to E, A to F, so on and then B to C, B to D, B to E, B to F and so on. Ultimately, factor analyses will tell you about the structure of the underlying variables. Who wants to live with what? Who goes home with who from the bar kind of a thing? And it will also tell you what the strength of those relationships are. The what, when, why. Think of factor analyses as finding the families of data. And it's a very great way to understand how your data works. So use it when you wish to discover the related families of variables within really large complex data sets. Use it when there might be variables that relate with one or more families. Sometimes you want to compare or rank the strength of the interconnections with families against those of other families. And sometimes you may want to predict the families with whom new data will associate. There are benefits and there are negatives that come along with factor analysis that are important to consider. Many of the pros are factor analyses are incredibly fast. It is a very well established uh, algorithm and it is extremely insightful. And the shape of the data is completely irrelevant. They can be normal, skewed, in any direction and the factor analysis will still work. There are cons which is the factor analyses themselves are complicated to interpret. The family strengths themselves are often arbitrary. The scores relate only within your data set. So you may end up with family relationships that appear strong in your data set, but in an entirely different type of data set, they may not be as strong. Or how do you compare those? Also, and this is a really key point, very small values such as nils, nulls, close to zero values, especially if it's a strongly, strongly right skewed data set, can have a big impact on the final outcome. All values are treated equally, even if they're small or large. Tools to work with factor analyses are R and Python. You can also use an ArcGIS Insights license, which is quite expensive. Uh, Statistica software, which is mildly expensive, and fortunately, there's also an online tool, which is a website that you can just load up your data and it will crunch it for you, which is fantastic, and I've included the link here. Here's a case study factor analysis in real world. We, this is called the Jefferson Project, and the company that I was working for wanted to image or fingerprint or discover a gold mineral system that was sitting underneath the soil cover. So we collected 2,000 soils and every one of those was geochemically assayed. We wanted to ask what elements group together, where do the families exist, and what do the collection of these families or the unique arrangement of these families tell us about mineralization or alteration. And the results are great. <laughs> Of the 2,000 soils collected, we had a very large multi-dimensional data set, performed the factor analysis, and here's an image of the results. Quick description about the image. We have our strongest factor internal to this data set, which is shown here in green, which is basically the host rock. 
Our second strongest factor, shown here in black, is mapped in the field as a very clear fault. Our next strongest factor, which is this sort of this pinky red color, or sorry, the orangey red color, and the blue factor are our mineralizing system that are directly correlated with small outcrops of an intrusion. And the weakest factor is this magenta color, which also correlates with the fault. And in the field, it represents some oxidation that happened along that fault. Ultimately, what we're able to show the client is this fantastic orange and blue fingerprint that completely highlights their mineral system even though the amount of outcrop is maybe three or four percent coverage. Success. All right, the next one I'm going to speak with you today about is K nearest neighbors. So K nearest neighbors, or abbreviated as KNN, is a way to classify data based on its proximity to other data, also multidimensional, and other data that is most similar, maybe not necessarily just in space, but in character to the data that you're trying to classify. Ultimately, it uses the distances and the counts of the neighboring values with which to assign the unknown variable. So, the what, when, why. Think of KN as a great classification scheme. You want to use this when you have unknown data that is mixed with a known data set, an example may be playing on the rock sample theme. Somebody hands me an assay. I don't know where the rocks come from. I don't know anything else about it. All I have is the assay. But let's say that I have a heap of other assays where I know an intrusion looks like this and maybe a basalt looks like that. And I can perform KNN and it will classify that sample as an intrusion or a basalt. Sometimes you may not even have a training set. You want to let the, let the data set itself come up with its own internal classification scheme. KNN is good for that. And you always want to use this when the data is complex and multidimensional. And the sample that's shown here should be fairly easy to pick, although not always, <laughs> where an unknown set should sit. So pros and cons are uh, KNN is incredibly fast. Uh, again, it's very well established. It's been around for a long time. The shape of the data is irrelevant, and it will give you a black and white answer. The KNN classification scheme will tell you this goes with green, or it goes with red, or it goes with blue, or whatever. There is no in between, and it's easy to interpret the results. Cons of the system, however, is that it can often be wrong, uh, especially in the case of outliers. We should run KNN several times because the classification will be different each time, slightly, and thus a training data set is really useful for KNN. If you have an example that you're going after, KNN will work towards those examples. Uh, the accuracy depends on the data quality. If you have data that's all over the map, the KNN will have a very difficult time coming up with the classification. So with KNN, you also must have an optimal number of neighbors. If you have two data points and you're trying to classify, it's very difficult. If you have thousands of data points, it's a lot easier. And KNN is also very poor at classifying data when it falls in the middle. So K neural network tools, same like the rest, R, Python. However, at least to my knowledge, there's no off-the-shelf solution that you might already have, such as ArcGIS Insights, Statistica, or a website that you can load up your data. Industry uses are, okay, industry uses. Uh, KNN is great when we're looking at hyperspectral imagery, for instance, in this case, agriculture, uh, looking at plant health, or even hyperspectral imagery of bare ground. So case study. We went out, we set out to classify some raw, raw hyperspectral data collected from drill core. In the drill core, uh, we have 1,400 pure reference minerals from the USGS, which are known spectra. That is our training set. We have 2,500 reference spectra uh, collection, sometimes more than one from each one of those reference minerals. 
and we have 2,000 new impure samples. We don't know what's in them, but they have gone through the hyperspectral analysis and we have the raw data. What are the questions? What minerals are in the new samples? And how much of that given mineral is in that new sample? The results? Brilliant. <laughs> of the 3,000 data points for each new sample, so along a wavelength, and the times the 2,500 reference vector that they were uh, investigated with, and then 2,000 samples, that meant that our computer went through 15 billion iterations to bring the answers back in just a few hours. Again, leveraging the power of the cloud. You can't run this on your laptop. So 8 hours, 32 CPUs, 60 gigs of RAM, and there we go. These are our results. For every given sample, we were able to use KNN to go through and classify any one of the 1,500 minerals and the percentages of that mineral in that sample. Last up, Random Forest. Random Forest is a hierarchical network of decisions. Uh, we, they're called decision trees. So if you turn left, and then you turn right, and then you turn left, dead end. So then you go back to the beginning, turn left, turn right, turn right. Uh, decision, decision trees are established in the Random Forest model completely randomly and without bias, and then tested, and then again, and again, and again. Random forest model will classify based on numerous iteration uh, so that if you do it enough, the truth will event, eventually float to the top in the random forest model. So the what, when, why. Think of random forest as great for predictions. So use it when you want to predict an outcome. When in your data model, you know that certain variables are fixed. When I turn on a tap, water comes out. What happens if I turn on that tap only part way? Or what happens if I break the pipe and then turn on the water? So you can tweak certain variables of a known relationship and predict the outcome. And it also works very, very well when you have little or no training data. So the pros are, it's a great predictive tool. Again, it's very insightful. Random Forest is incredibly useful in very complex data sets. And the sum is greater than the parts. Random forest models can be used in everything from gambling to predicting a person's behavior, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime Video, and Disney Plus might all give you suggestions based on your viewing or your listening experience. That's a random forest model where you can have three or four people contribute and the results are going to be uh, well worth and greater than just the four contributions. The cons are that this is a very slow model to run. It's incredibly computationally intense. The results must have a low correlation. Uh, it's very not descriptive, and it can suffer from overfitting. What those mean is think of this as a adventure, choose your adventure model from the 1980s, or choose your adventure book from the 1980s, where at some point, if it's a poorly written choose your adventure book, and you always end up dead, or you always end up not succeeding in the book, you won't read the rest of the book. And that's exactly what happens in a random forest model. If the result happens to be too, uh, too often one result, then the random forest model will be skewed, and we call that overfitting, and it doesn't matter what any of the other tweaks are, it will always tell you that that's the one result. So you must have a very you must have a data set that has a high variety. Tools, same tools, R, Python. I've included a script here that's available for free to use uh, the Python script on your data. And ArcGIS, Statistica, and website, as far as I know, there's no easy options there that you might already have. Case study, we wanted to know where to spend exploration dollars on developing new data sets for exploration. And so we had uh, from one site, we had geophysics, soils, outcrops, and we had some interpreted geology and digital elevation. And the question was, what data sets are most likely to predict geology? Which ones should we invest in, and which ones do we not need to invest in? The results were great. <laughs> Ultimately, in this particular case, the reduced-to-pole electromagnetics was determined 
after 10 iterations of going through the random forest model to have the highest corresponding uh, correlation with geology. Meaning, if we had a different rock type with all of the other data sets, that would be reflected in the RTP magnetics versus any of the others. However, we weren't able to answer our final question, which was, can we create a new map simply based on the random forest model? We could predict what a rock type might be, but we couldn't actually create a brand new map yet. So that ends my discussion today on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Please contact me here if you have any further questions.